Good morning. This is Business Live with me, Ian King. And we begin today with the government's AI Safety Summit, which has kicked off at Bletchley Park, home of Britain's second World War codebreakers. The event is bringing together world leaders, leading academics and top tech executives. Among the latter in attendance are Elon Musk, the owner of Twitter, Sam Altman, founder of ChatGPT's parent company, OpenAI, and Demis Hasibis, founder of Google DeepMind. Rishi Sunak hopes the event will build understanding of the risks involved with AI and ways of safely reaping the technology's benefits. But can it succeed in that aim? Well, joining me now is James Clough. He's co-founder and chief technology officer at Robin AI. James, welcome to you. What do you think this summit can realistically achieve? So I think the summit's done a really good job of keeping its focus very narrow. So it's focused on frontier AI risk, which are the risk posed by new, very powerful AI models that perhaps haven't been created yet, but could be created in a few years and could act in very unpredictable ways. So that focus is, I think, the right thing to do. What we hope to see from the summit is, I think, a, a roadmap, a plan to go forward for how we can mitigate those risks from frontier AI while not stifling the innovation that that technology can bring businesses like us. Obviously, the UK set out plans for AI regulation, but can it meaningfully have that much influence when the, both the US and the EU are already some way down the road with their own proposals? I, I think it can. So the government's uh, white paper on AI regulation released earlier in this year, I think, had a very positive approach. It was a very pro-innovation approach that recognised, as well as the risks of AI, also the benefits that it can bring. So that was a really positive direction. I think a better one than was approached by the EU in its AI Safety Act. I think the US has taken a bit of a middle ground between those two in that executive action announced yesterday. But I think we have an opportunity to not just sort of lead the way in terms of setting out that pro-innovation regulation, but also to build an environment where the next generation of really successful and big technology companies can actually be built in the UK. It's a good point you make that. I mean, I hear from a lot of your peers, they say, why is everyone so obsessed with regulating AI? Why aren't people talking more about the opportunities it's going to create? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. We think that there's a huge degree of opportunity that could be created by a really transformative technology. Now, I think some people have said that generative AI has been overhyped. I actually think it might be underhyped still, that there's still a huge degree of change that we're going to see over the next few years. And this will be a technology that's as transformative as personal computers or smartphones or the internet. So your message would be don't, don't be scared of this stuff. You know, get your arms around it, regulators, by all means, but don't throttle it. Yeah, exactly. Our message would be to say that it's possible to build regulation that protects consumers from deep fakes or from being misled by chatbots, for example, while also having a more liberal pro-innovation approach to business-to-business -to -business AI applications like ours, which can provide really big productivity gains that the economy needs. Yeah, you better explain to uh, people what you actually do. Yeah, so we're Robin AI. We're a legal technology company and we build an AI co-pilot for the legal sector. So what that means is that we've got an AI assistant that helps lawyers and paralegals work with contracts. It helps them draft contracts, review and negotiate them and search through all the contracts that they've signed before. We speak to in-house lawyers and we found that they spend about half of their time working on very standard documents and standard agreements, which it's not the best use of their time. It's not the most valuable thing they could be doing. It's not why they went to law school in the first place. So we can help automate that work, make it five times or ten times faster, which frees them up to do more valuable or more strategic work. How does what you do differ from the likes of Luminance? Yeah, so what we do is really focus on that generative AI aspect that doesn't just categorise documents or work out what they say, but actually provides suggestions to lawyers who are working with those documents as to how to add new content or how to modify content in contracts that have been sent to them while drawing from both live AI suggestions and also all of the precedents and signed documents that they've worked with in the past. OK, and are you profitable at this stage? Well, we're a very fast-growing technology company, which means that we're raising capital and using that to grow and expand. So we raised a round of funding earlier than this year and expect to raise another round later this year as well. And we're using that money to grow internationally. We've just opened an office in New York and also expand our, our product line. So yesterday we announced a new version of our product that lives inside Microsoft Word, which is a software that lawyers use more than anything else. So uh, what, what is a typical customer for you? Is, is it the sort of big commercial law heavyweights or is it, can you, is it right down to the sort of high street solicitor? So for us, it, it tends not to be law firms, actually. It's in-house legal teams at big companies, usually in quite regulated sectors. So 
Some of our customers include household names like uh, PepsiCo, Yum Foods, AbbVie, but also big banks, big private equity funds, and companies in regulated sectors like pharmaceuticals and, and aerospace. Now, the guest list for this summit is only 100 strong. Startups like you have been largely excluded. Mistake? I actually don't think that's too big of a mistake. And the reason is that the focus of the summit is on those frontier AI models, which we're using, but most startups aren't creating those models because they cost hundreds of millions of dollars to train. So I think it's the right decision to keep the focus of the summit narrow, to keep the guest list to the people who are building those models and the world leaders who need to build that regulation. But if there's later conversations about the broader sector of AI regulation, I think that will be the time to bring in startups like us. All right, James, got to leave it there. Good to talk to you this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Some other business news stories for you now. And the UK government has reportedly scrapped guarantees on nearly £1 billion worth of bank loans handed out to ailing businesses during the COVID pandemic. Well, previously unreported figures obtained by Reuters under a Freedom of Information request show that the state-owned British Business Bank, which administers the loan schemes, has removed state guarantees from nearly 11,000 loans worth a combined £979 million. Well, the move shields taxpayers from losses in the event of those loans not being repaid, but potentially leaves lending banks on the hook. Next, today raised its full-year profits forecast for the fourth time in six months. The fashion retailer now expects pre-tax profits before one-off items for the year to the end of January next year to come in at £885 million. That's £10 million more than was previously forecast. Well, the news came as Next reported that its full price sales in August, September and October were up 4% on the same period last year and better than the 2% growth it had been expecting. It cited a cooler-than-average August and typical autumn weather in October for the sales uplift rather than any underlying changes in the consumer economy. Next shares currently ahead by just under 3%. UK house prices unexpectedly rose last month, according to Nationwide Building Society. The UK's second biggest mortgage lender said house prices in October were up 0.9% on September, reflecting a lack of supply in the market. On a year-on-year -year basis, prices were down 3.3% on October last year. Well, Nationwide said the average UK house price was now £259,423. And the Japanese carmaker Toyota has more than doubled its quarterly profits on the back of the weaker yen and booming demand for its hybrid vehicles. The world's biggest carmaker by sales said that during the three months to September, it made an operating profit of 1.44 trillion yen, that's £7.8 billion, and up from 562.8 billion yen in the same period last year. Toyota said sales were up in all parts of the world, with sales of its hybrid vehicles up 41%. The news comes a day after the company said it would raise investment in its planned battery plant in North Carolina by an extra US$8 billion. US dollars. Now, the drugs giant GSK said this morning that sales and profits this year would be better than expected. Britain's second biggest pharmaceutical company, which had already raised its forecast once this year, highlighted a strong performance from its vaccine division, which, in the three months to the end of September, enjoyed a 33% year-on-year rise in sales. Well, in particular, RxV, that's its vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus, generated sales of £709 million during the quarter. And revenue from its shingles vaccine, Shingrix, came in at £825 million, which was up 15% on the same period last year. Well, with me now for more on this is Juliana Tattlebaum, anchor at our sister channel, CNBC. Juliana, great to see you this morning. A pleasure to be here. Talk me through uh, the extent of these uh, upgrades. So this is a pretty strong set of earnings for GSK. Not only did they beat expectations on the quarter, but they've also raised guidance once again, as you said. So we're looking at total Q3 sales uh, up 10%, up 16% when you exclude their COVID-related sales. And the guidance upgrade was pretty broad-based and substantial. They're now looking at turnover to increase 12 to 13 percent for the full year. We were at 8 to 10 percent as of July. So pretty substantial increase there. Um, adjusted operating profit growth also upgraded, now looking at 13 to 15 percent, up from 11 to 13 percent. And they've also upgraded their uh, EPS growth target for the year. Now, the upgrades have come primarily due to uh, 
from vaccines, as you mentioned, really strong performance from their vaccine division and so much excitement around Arexv, this RSV vaccine. It's the first of its kind. This one is designed for older adults. That's where it's being used so far. And they called the U.S. launch, which took place this year, outstanding. So really strong uptake of this new vaccine. They're also seeing steady demand for their shingles vaccine, which is another key part of their vaccine franchise. Um, now, when I step back and put these numbers into context, there are still outstanding concerns around where future growth is going to come from for GSK. They've undergone a huge amount of structural change. Uh, most recently, and perhaps most substantially, the spinoff of Halion, the consumer business uh, last year. But still, investors are wondering where the next leg of growth is going to come from. So certainly, these vaccine figures are encouraging the prospects for the RSV vaccine in particular, but still a lot of question marks as to what's going to drive the share price from here. Yeah, I mean, why all the excitement about Arexvi? I mean, it's, it's delivered via a jab, isn't it, which is one thing that gets people excited. Well, there has been an uptick in RSV cases and certainly a spotlight on the severity of these cases post-COVID in the U.S. especially. Uh, and we're, we've seen about 700 million pounds worth of sales in Q3. GSK Today came out and said that they are likely to see that number hit 1 billion pounds this year for the RSV vaccine alone. So uptick, uh, excuse me, uptake has been very strong. Some analysts have cautioned that we may see softer Q4 in terms of sales given the inventory build, but long term, uh, the excitement is pretty substantial around this vaccine. I mean, you've talked a lot about vaccines. Are there other, are there other parts of GSK that are motoring as well? So GSK, because they've been under so much pressure from shareholders, is trying to drive growth across a number of development areas. So it's not just vaccines. They're also doing work to bulk up their oncology business, specialty medicines. GSK historically tried to stay away from oncology. They thought that cancer drugs were not a great area to be in because of concerns around pricing power. Uh, AstraZeneca, their main competitor, has gone very heavy into oncology, and in many ways that bet has paid off. So they're trying to spread the, uh, their, their bets wide. One thing to just bear in mind as we digest these numbers, there is an overhang on the stock, and that is the outstanding Zantac litigation, their old heartburn uh, treatment, which there are claims against it in the U.S. Uh, that it causes cancer. Uh, they have settled a number of these cases, but there are a number still outstanding that are going to come into focus next year. So that's kind of kept a lid on the stock so far this year. All right, Juliana, I've got to leave it there. Great to have you with me this morning. Thank you. Now, one of the big social trends since the lockdowns is the increasing popularity of solo travel. Google searches for solo travel have quadrupled since 2020. But travelling alone can carry risks, for women in particular. Well, now Airbnb is partnering with the personal safety app WalkSafe Plus to provide tips to women travelling alone. Well, with me now, I'm pleased to say, is the founder of WalkSafe Plus, Emma Kay. Emma, welcome to you. How rapidly is solo travel growing among women? Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, the stats are fantastic. Um, Airbnb's research has showed that there has been a 55% increase in solo travel internationally. And actually, if we look at that um, domestically in the UK, that's up by 27%, which is fantastic. It's just showing that, you know, one in five nights now booked on the platform um, is a woman doing solo travel. It's just awesome. Which are the most popular destinations? Oh, good question. So I think if you were looking in the UK, it would be London, it would be um, it would be Cornwall, I think it'd be Bristol, it'd be Brighton, um, even Edinburgh. I think if you're looking abroad, so actually my first Airbnb stay was Paris. So Paris is the number one, then we've got Dubai, we've got uh, Lisbon. It's yeah, Barcelona, lots of lovely city breaks. So what are the kinds of advice that you're giving women solo travellers with this app? So I'm really asking and calling for women to download WalkSafe before they head out. It's just another um, safety um, piece of advice in their toolkit. I'm also asking them to, you know, really think about preparing for their journey before they leave the house. So if you are um, heading out to... Uh, a place via our Airbnb to ensure that you share your itinerary ahead of time, that you can ask your host uh, where is safe and non-safe, so you've got that knowledge of the local neighbourhoods. 
Um, and thinking about not sharing your journey in real time. I think we're all a little bit guilty for doing that. Wait until you've gotten home and you're safe. Um, downloading the app, look, we're free to use, free to download. We have a suite of digital tools to really help you stay safer. And of course, I'm a bit of a sucker for things like an a, a alarmed door um, stopper, because I think that things like that can just help you to feel a bit safer when you're at um, a new place. As you mentioned, you're, you're free to use, free to download. What, what's the business model? How do you make money? Good question. We make money via our other revenue generating products. So we keep the app free because we believe personal safety is a basic human right. And then what we end up doing is we can uh, talk about and sell our safety seminars. We do bespoke crime analysis. And we also have WalkSafe Pro, which is our platform that seamlessly links with our WalkSafe Safe Plus app. And actually that enables businesses to help their staff to get home safely. So we have lots of different revenue models that enable us to sustain this free app. And how many times has the app been downloaded to date? Well, I think we're heading on near a million, which we've actually seen a 90% increase in downloads in the last month due to, I think, you know, lots of different factors from a cost of living crisis down to um, the dark nights. And I think women just needing that extra little bit of safety. OK, and we've got to leave it there. Good to see you today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the oil price sold off sharply overnight as supply concerns continue to ease. At one point today, in fact, uh, Brent crude hit its lowest level since the 6th of October, the day, of course, before Hamas terrorists attacked Israeli citizens. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $86.56 a barrel. So it's a bit of a rally this morning, up by nearly one and three quarter percent since the open. On the equity markets, well, last night's gains on Wall Street were followed by a largely positive session overnight for stocks in the Asia-Pacific region. The highlight in the region overnight, of course, the Nikkei in Tokyo on the top left of the screen there, up nearly 2.5%, uh, partly down to those strong figures from Toyota, which is uh, ahead by some 4%, I think, at the uh, close. In Europe, stocks have had a largely downbeat uh, start to uh, the new month, of course. November, one of the uh, best months of the year, traditionally, for uh, UK equities. That's the, talking, uh, that's the situation right now. Talking points today include the Danish renewables giant Orsted. Its shares are down by some 17% in Copenhagen after it halted two US offshore wind projects and took a big impairment charge on them. You'll recall that BP did something similar yesterday on that front. Well, here in London, I mentioned BP just now. The FTSE 100 off by a fifth of 1%. And BP is actually continuing to weigh on the index following its disappointing quarterly numbers yesterday. The leading blue chip faller, though, right now in percentage terms is the commercial property group Seagrow. The shares there off by nearly two and three quarter percent on adverse broker comment. Among the gainers, well, Next is among the uh, leading blue chip gainers right now, up uh, nearly three and a half percent on those uh, results. Meanwhile, Airtel Africa continues to be sought after its recent results earlier this week. The shares up two and a quarter percent. Outside the FTSE 100, the interdealer broker TP ICAP is ahead by nearly three percent following its trading update yesterday. To the downside, Aston Martin Legonda is off 12 percent after lowering its annual volume forecast. And ASOS, which you can see on the screen there, off by nearly 11 percent. That's after it forecast another sales decline this year. On the foreign exchange markets, well, the big story, again, continues to be the Japanese yen. It's fallen today to a near 33-year low against the US dollar. That was after the Bank of Japan proved less hawkish than expected yesterday. Sterling off a fifth of 1% against the greenback, more or less unchanged against the euro. The single currency off nearly a third of 1% right now against the dollar. Well, with me to discuss all of that is Rachel Winter, partner, of course, at Killer Kinko. Rachel, good to see you this morning. Um, we should start with next, really, because... Uh, it carries on the upgrading its forecasts. It does, yeah. So we've had a, a nice upgrade this morning to their, their profit forecast. It's not a massive upgrade. So they're now expecting to make 885 million. And that's only an upgrade of 10 million. So in percentage terms, it's not huge. But clearly, it's had a good boost for sentiment. And the shares are up today. My favourite part about the update this morning was a chart they showed of weekly sales and they showed what the weather was doing in each week. And it really showed that when the weather is cold, people tend to spend more because warm weather clothing is more expensive. And I think that really reassured investors because we have had quite a warm September and I think that has weighed on the sales of some clothing providers. Yeah, I mean, if you're a clothes re retailer, you basically want the weather to do what it's supposed to at various times of the year. You know, yes. hot in the summer and windy at this time of year. Exactly. You want it to get cold as soon as winter starts, so people start buying lots of expensive coats. 
Well, elsewhere in the sector, of course, we had an update today from ASOS. And again, you know, the red ink is flowing in all directions. Yeah, so these shares are now down over 95% on a five-year basis. So I wonder if, you know, we've had quite a strong share price reaction this morning. I wonder if that shows that some people are just giving up and bailing out, having lost so much money already. The update was quite disappointing. So the losses were nearly £300 million. Uh, the revenue was a bit behind where people expected. And furthermore, the company has said they expect revenue to decline next year as well. So it feels as though the turnaround here is not really progressing as quickly as people would have hoped. And of course, Mike Ashley's Fraser Group, Fraser's Group is lurking in the background. They've already built a stake. I mean, would you expect them to sort of pounce on any share price weakness and top up? Possibly. They have bought up a, a huge amount of the high street, so I'm sure they will be interested, especially now that the shares have come down so much more. Now elsewhere today, trading update from Aston Martin Lagonde. I mean, th this stock price really does whip around all over the place. It, it does, but this is another one like ASOS, which is down 95% over five years. So again, I think investors are probably feeling quite impatient with this one. The issue today was a, a downgrade to the number of cars they expect to sell for next year. So this is focused on the DB12, which is their new model. They had expected to sell 7,000. They've reduced that to 6,700. So not a massive downgrade, but the reason they gave was some problems with the infotainment system. And I think any mention of software problems with newer vehicles does get investors concerned. So I think that's the reason why the shares are down so much this morning. Yeah, we had Lawrence Stroll, the executive chairman on the programme recently. Of course, he's, he's just topped up his stake. Well, I mean, the shares have come down so much. So I think perhaps to him they look cheap. And as a, a show of confidence, when you see the chairman or the chief executive buying in, it can be a good spur to get other investors to buy in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, elsewhere, trading update today from Smurfit Kappa, of course, formerly FTSE 100 stock, it's now just moved its main listing to the US. Yeah, a decent update here. Um, so this company, it makes cardboard boxes, it makes packaging. It did incredibly well during COVID because people were buying so much online. Now that people have returned to in-store shopping, packaging sales have declined and they're still declining. But today, Smurfit said that the decline is starting to slow. So that's good news for the, for the shares. We have seen them rise a bit this morning. But as you say, people are really just focusing on this ongoing merger with Westrock, which is a, a US-based company. And as you say, when this goes through, 65% of revenue will then come from the US, and therefore the company is moving its main listing to the US, which is a real shame for London. It is. It really is good company. Uh, before I let you go, Rachel, obviously the big event in markets today, US Federal Reserve uh, meeting later on today. Any change do you expect? No, I think they'll leave interest rates on hold, but what we're really waiting for is the commentary, which hopefully will give some indicators as to what they'll do with future interest rate policy. All right, Rachel, got to leave it there. Good to see you as ever. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it from me for the time being. I'm back. I will be back at uh, half past four this afternoon with our afternoon edition when my guests are going to include David Potts, the chief executive of Morrison's. You really don't want to miss that. He does not give many interviews, so uh, I'll be speaking to him at half four. Hope you can join me for that. See you later on. Cheerio.